The North Sea is full of fish, but who decides what to catch and how do they do it? Our next speaker has worked at the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen. Now she's at the Center for the Study of the Sciences and Humanities. She speaks fantastic Nynorsk, but today she will present in her native tongue from Indiana. Please welcome Dorothy Dankel. Hello. Several years ago, when I was doing my PhD at Hallforskningsinstitutet, my boss asked me if I can go out on this ship. This is a ship uh, from Karmai that fishes sand eel, octobus. Uh, I was going to take samples, scientific samples, of the length and weight of the different uh, individuals on the catches. So sand eel is an important fish in the North Sea. It's super cute, little eel-like fish, and it buries itself in the sand. It sticks its head up and feeds. Uh, it's also a very important part of the ecosystem. So sand eel is uh, one of the main foods for puffins and other important seabirds. But I was on this boat for seven days, and there were six other crew members and a captain on board. And after three days of working on this ship, I realized nobody had said a word to me. I hadn't had a single eye contact or a single conversation with the guys on board. Uh, this became really irritating, uh, so I went up to the bridge and I knew I had to break the ice somehow. So I asked the captain if I can look at his logbook. And he said yes, and I started looking at his data from the catches and comparing it to mine. And then he looked over my shoulder and said, well, can I see your data? And I said, yeah, of course. And we started talking. And apparently that was enough uh, that the crew members saw what was happening, and that night we had a really lively discussion. It was really nice. But then I just had to ask them, why didn't you guys talk to me the first three days? And they said, well, you're the first woman ever on this ship. We didn't know it was going to happen if we talked to you. <laughs> so, sometimes tradition should be broken so we can get some sort of integration going on. And the issue I'm going to talk about today is that fisheries management is inherently interdisciplinary, but our scientific advice is still based on the biological assessments. Now, this is a very interesting uh, point here, that when we do the stock assessment, we're looking uh, at a little part of the ocean and trying to get an idea of how many fish there are in the sea. It's very important that we do that and base some advice on there. But there are other benefits that come from fish. Uh, more than just counting how many fish there are. There are jobs at sea, jobs at land. Uh, there's the consumer benefits of having fish on their plate, nutritional values, profitability is also uh, important. So the problem is that we don't have assessments that integrate these different types of data that exist. So here's a philosophical question for you. What is science? Actually, both of these guys are correct from their different perspectives. The guy on the left says, sees four sticks, the guy on the right sees three. So the question is, who should decide and on what basis, what perspective should they use? So let me just give a quick overview of how fisheries management is done. You can use the North Sea as an example. So there's the science aspect, where we have acoustic survey data from the Institute of Marine Research and other collaborators around the North Sea, and we combine this with the catch data that we know from the industry, and we do a statistical analysis uh, and our regeneration of what we think uh, the population should be, and that's our stock assessment. We do this in collaboration with our scientists, colleagues, uh, DTU Aqua in Denmark, Imades in the Netherlands, of course, Hallforskning Institute, the Institute of Marine Research. And this is all done under the umbrella of ICES, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, which is um, actually the world's oldest intergovernmental organization, founded in 1902, conglomerate of marine scientists there. So ICES gives the advice, uh, first making the first draft of the advice through the advice drafting groups of the total allowable catch, the TAC. And then the advisory committee of ICES formalizes this TAC advice and gives it to the ICES clients. There's many different clients of ICES advice, scientific advice. For example, the North Sea, EU, and Norway are ICES clients. Then this advice goes to negotiation. It's put on the center of the table as the recommended scientific catch. And then the negotiation among the coastal states begins. How should we share this total allowable catch? And then once they agree on it, they divvy it up among their boats, among their fleets. 
So this is an annual cycle that goes, and uh, it's a well-oiled machine, and it works to an extent, because we also see a lot of protests, uh, not uh, necessarily only in, I mean, there's not this type of protests in Norway, but some of these are taken from France, where high, higher diesel prices are a big impediment for profitability in the fleet. Uh, some other uh, protesters here from the United States, the East Coast of the United States, has a lot of problems with uh, viable stocks. And there's one protester that's holding up a sign with three question marks, and he's asking, what about the economic impact assessments? Have those been taken under consideration? So we ask ourselves, are these social replica rep repercussions of having just the biological-based advice without taking the whole of the system, the social aspects, the economic aspects? So if we look at the context of fisheries management, we can start to understand where the linkages, linkages are. And uh, in a biosocioeconomic synthesis, we can put together this in a modeling framework. We don't have scientists sitting in their corners. We bring the data to the middle of the table and try to make some sense out of it. So I've done this type of assessment uh, with data from the profitability survey from the Norwegian Fisheries Directorate, Lundsum Hetz in Nusrekesa, and uh, NOFIMA with uh, 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 employment data from Troms. And so we can combine a biological assessment model with an employment model, an economic model, integrate that data, and look at different management strategies. But then we have a problem. How do you decide? The economist is saying, well, profitability is going up. The stock assessor says, well, uh, the stock is going down. The social scientist is in the middle. These conflicting assessments can confuse the decision maker. So what do we do with that? Well, one solution is that we can integrate the assessment with stakeholder preferences. Let's put the stakeholders in the center now. So we can do this by thinking of stakeholders as people. For example, Nina Jensen, uh, WWF fronting there. Uh, Elizabeth Osbok, our, our uh, fisheries minister. Silla Loge, the Norwegian Pelagic Buyers and Sellers Association, Fiskebot. All these are different stakeholders. And each of these stakeholders have different preferences coming out of the system. Somewhat jobs, somewhat profitability, somewhat ecosystems to be preserved for future generations. So there's a different balance here. Who, is, who are going to be the winners? Who are going to be the losers in fisheries management? Well, let's turn to the famous philosopher John Rawls, American philosopher, I should say, with his difference principle in his book, The Theory of Justice, where the greatest benefit should be given to the least advantaged members of society. So this is one way we can balance stakeholder preferences. We call this joint stakeholder satisfaction, where we're looking at the conglomerate of stakeholders, their different preferences, and try to look for management strategies that is satisfying everyone as much as possible. So this is work that I've done together with uh, Miko Heino at the um, biology department here at University of Bergen and Ulf Diekmann at the uh, International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, SIASA. And here in this framework, we're trying to show other scientists how we could put together the different forms of data that exist. So we have our biological model with our ICES data and our socioeconomic model based on the profitability surveys and the NOFEMA data. And then we have different components of utility that come out of our models, profitability, jobs, ecosystem preservation, and our different stakeholders. And we can look at stakeholder-specific utility then. So let me just show you uh, one result. We've done this for COD and Kaplan. I'll show you the, the Kaplan results. Where now we're in a modeling world, so we have that kind of um, can play God. So let's look at all of the parameter space. For example, a strategy with a uh, different um, minimum size of capture, and then on the x-axis we can have increasing fishing pressure. So what I'm going to plot here is the percentage of this joint stakeholder satisfaction. When you have lots of different stakeholders who all want different things coming out of the system, how high can we get that satisfaction? 100% would be everybody agrees on this strategy, 0% would be nobody agrees. This is the, what we see in the modeling results. This point here is where we're uh, managing the stock currently, we're just using the biological assessment as, as the scientific foundation for that decision. And this is the maximum joint stakeholder satisfaction that we get when we're looking at the coupled employment and profitability and biological assessment. We can get up to 70% of the stakeholders agreeing that this is the best strategy to go forward with. There's a difference here. 
So the integration of data with the integration of societal preferences can perhaps lead to more robust and informed decision making. So the benefits here are that integrated assessment can clarify trade-offs. There's always going to be trade-offs in the system. We have to understand that, have a dialogue about that, but on an informed basis. So one of the key words here is integration. Integration is from a calculus perspective where we're scientifically combining the different data together to get a, a one holistic type of picture, uh, picture, using our joint stakeholder satisfaction as a transdisciplinary effect there, but also as a stimulus. We have to have this dialogue, and we should do this, because these are shared, natural, renewable resources. We need to take care of them. So to, in summary, integrated assessments for fisheries management, they quantify the inherent trade-offs of the system. They shed light on society's preferences. They make use of the diverse data. We have the data in Norway. That's the cool thing about it. We have all this rich data from the fisheries directorate. And then illuminate transdisciplinary opportunities. I was glad that I broke the ice on that boat, and it was kind of an honor to be the first woman ever on the boat. But somebody has to do it. Traditions can be changed. But when I was starting my PhD, there was a warning that came out from the scientific community in 2006. And Paul Dengbal, another senior fishery scientist, said, cross-disciplinary work must be rewarded, not punished. You can't expect that people would freely and knowingly risk their careers. If fishery scientists, be the biologists, economists, or sociologists, anthropologists, are forced to make such a choice, cross-disciplinary co cooperation will continue to be something that we talk about, but never realize. So, I'm trying to say that Bergen could be a world leader in this type of integration for the better of society. So we can have, where is it, here it is, flex this collective muscle, <laughs> bring that all together the data that we have in Bergen. Thank you very much, I'm Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Dorothy is also a co-founder and board member of the new Nordic Marine Think Tank.